What did we speak about last week of Christ being what? A tent peg. Um, I hope... I hope you are stepping out in new areas. I hope you've identified. God says, enlarge the place of your tent. That's, that's as individuals and as a church, we are to enlarge. We're, we're to increase our influence. We're to take new steps of faith. Uh, have you identified areas like that? Because if you do, you will need to be strengthened in Christ to do that. And we talked about the fact that when a tent is made heavier, you need heavier um, tent pegs. And, and, and the only way you can strengthen yourself is to be attached to Christ as a tent peg. He is the one that will take the weight. But there is another reason why you need to strengthen your tent pegs. And it's this. If you have determined to step out into a new area, it doesn't matter how small or how big it is, when you step out into a new area, you're expanding the kingdom of God. You're bringing the kingdom in. And when you do that, you will get opposition. Because Satan, um, you're invading Satan's land. He inherits a lot of land. Uh, let me tell you this. He doesn't inherit it legally. He's a squatter. He, he, he squats, he, 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 his, all the land he's got is illegal by deceit. But we as Christians, when you take land, when you take land from him, you're establishing the kingdom of God. In other words, you're taking a flag and you're saying, this land is for God. It could be a personal issue in your life. It might be a new area in your life you're taking. You're taking from the power of Satan and you're establishing God. That, that is powerful. It might be people in your family. It might be loved ones you want to be saved. It might be all sorts of situations. It might be something in your street, in your neighborhood, in your city, in your school, in your workplace. Wherever you take land, Christians are to take land for God and bring in the kingdom of God. But when you do that, Satan isn't going to roll over. If you've decided, you might have said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take health for my family or for myself. Once you determine and you're saying, I'm going to take what Christ has won for me. Once you decide that, you will get opposition. You will find that the war will intensify. Now, let me say this. Some people think, oh, um, we, we go into spiritual warfare. Let me tell you this. You are always in war. You are always in war. Because in Genesis, it says, God said, I put enmity between the Satan's seed and, 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 and man's seed. So there is enmity there. But if you start to take land for God, if you start to take personal land for God, the war will intensify. And so we will need to know how to fight. We will need to know that we are to stand in this. And, and, and so we get to this place where um, it says in Zechariah, from Judah will come the battle bow. In other words, uh, it, Christ is going to do some special things for us. He's going to extend our borders. Our borders uh, but, but he is going to in, increase and enable us to go to war. And that's what I want to really bring. Now, when Christ appears, um, when, when Zechariah prophesied, he said, when he comes, he will bring, he will bring the battle bow to us. Now, I, I find it quite ironic, or a bit of irony here, that in this day of modern warf warfare, we are going to defeat Satan with bow and arrows. But that's what I'm talking about today. We're going to defeat Satan with bow and arrows. The battle bow, of course, is his victory on the cross. He, when he died and he rose again, he gave us complete victory over the enemy. But with a bow, you have to draw it. You have to bend the bow, don't you? To, in, in order to use the bow, you have to bend it. Now, when Christ died on the cross, he finished the work. But you have to then act. You have to take what he's won and draw it. Do you understand? 
You see, when Christ died, he didn't die to give God the victory over Satan. God, God, God can destroy Satan at any time. There's no battle there. There's no battle in the heavens. G Christ came and died to give you victory over Satan. In Romans 16, it says, it's, it's the, the most amazing paradox in the whole Bible. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. It's for you and me and the church to rise up and draw the bow. Do you understand? It's a very important thing. It's time for us to do that. It's time for us to take the battle bow and use it. Now, there is a great psalm in the Bible. Um, it's, it's a fantastic psalm. Um, and if you want to know about spiritual warfare, um, you just read it. Psalm 18 it is. And uh, I just want to turn it to you. If I had the time, I'd read this whole chapter to you. But I'm not going to. But I want to just take one verse from it. And it says this. Let me read you this. It says this. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. Now, um, it's, it's fascinating. It's speaking of a bow of bronze now. Um, the, the order in that verse is quite significant. It says, he trains my hands for war, I can bend a bow of bronze. In other words, a weak person will not be able to bend that bow. It'll be too strong for him. In other words, God has to train you. He has to train your arms and your fingers. Um, I don't know if you've ever done archery. I haven't. But just getting an ordinary bow is quite difficult to draw. But to, bow, to draw a, a bow of bronze, to draw this bow, you need a lot of strength. And a weak person will not be able to do it. And you say, how, how can I be trained to bend a bow, the bow that God's given me for victory? How can I use the cross of Christ in, 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 with power and strength? And I say this, God has to do it by in smaller ways. Now, um, I don't know if anybody works out here. It's, um, it's uh, JP here, Jean-Pierre. Is Jean-Pierre here? He's gone with the kids. Oh, I was going to ask him. Now, Jean-Pierre works in the gym. Anybody work out here? Anybody works out? You, you I, I can't remember your name. I don't know your name. What is your name? Peter. Peter. Do you do weights? Now, say you go to the gym, all right? And uh, uh, if, if Jean-Pierre, he will train you, you see, he'll tell you what to do. But if you wanted to get a huge weight up, wh what would your advice, what would the advice given to you be? And, and how would you practice? Could you do a big weight straight away? And, and, and how would you do it? How, how, would you, how would you take a big weight up? Ah, oh, that's it. You got it. Yeah. You start with smaller weights, don't you? You, you can't just do the big things straight off. I'm sorry to embarrass you. Um, um, but you can't do big weights straight off. You have to do the smaller ones first, don't you? Now, I've discovered this. If you're going to defeat Satan, you have to defeat him in the small things. Every day, every day you can train your hands for war. Did you know that? Every day you can. Every day when you're driving and somebody cuts you up, you can train your hands for war. You can, you can not get angry. Do you understand? Every, every day you could take offense. Somebody could offend you. And you do not take offense. Once you do that, you're training your hands. Every temptation you get, you can walk along the street and be tempted. But if you can resist temptation, then you're strengthening your hands. Am I communicating this? Do you understand? That's how you train. Listen, you walk through life. Every day you can take an opportunity to get strong. Every day you can. David, David just didn't de defeat Goliath. 
He did it when he was caring for his flock. And he defended his flock. He started there. Do you understand? It says, it says in Ephesians 6. Um, let me read you Ephesians 6. Let me read you this. This is very important. Ephesians 6 says this. It says this. Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand. It says, if, if you're trained for war, then when the, the evil day comes, in other words, the big day, if you've trained, if you've been using the, the bow, you'll be able to bend the bow of bronze. Every challenge you face is an opportunity to be ready for this. So, um, let me think, the, the challenge I want to leave, leave with you is this. The bow needs to be drawn. It needs to be drawn. You, to, to, to use the work of Christ on the cross in your daily life, you need to draw the bow. But the second thing you do, need to do is you need to load it. It needs to have arrows. Do you understand? It needs to have arrows. The battle bow needs arrows to shoot. Now, um, arrows, arrows in the Bible, if you, if you look in the Psalms, the arrows are often referred to speech and words. So the simple fact is this, is you put the cross of Christ into action by the way you speak. That's how Satan is overcome. If you look in Revelation 12, you get the bow and arrows there. It says this, they will overcome him by the blood of the lamb, by the cross, and by the words of your testimony. That's it. You put the cross into operation with the way you speak. The power of your speech is incredible. That's how you defeat Satan. You declare the wonders of what Christ has done. You know, um, it, Paul says, we preach Christ and him crucified. The evangelical, let me tell you, the evangelical say, oh, I must get cross in my sermons. That's not the issue. It's not you just got to say the cross. It's this, that when you have allowed the cross of Christ to touch your life, then you declare what Christ has done. This is what the cross has done in my life. He's washed me. He's cleansed me. He's anointed me. He's delivered me. He's healed me. He's given me strength. He's consecrated me. He's given me power. This is the work of the cross. I could spend endless times telling you what, the Christ, what Christ has done through the cross in my life. When you speak it, there's power. Are you with me? The way you overcome the enemy is resist him. Now, resisting is not just saying no. You don't, it is partly that. It isn't, it, but it's more than just saying no. It's declaring the truth. That's what Jesus did in the wilderness against Satan. He declared the truth of God's word. Do you understand? It's, it's when the cross has had its work in our lives and we speak it. It's powerful. That's how we preach the cross. We declare his victory over our lives. Now, I just want to look at, at, at two accounts. I'm, I just want to take two accounts in the Bible where we see this in operation. And, and if you are taking ground in your life, you will see how it operates. I want to turn, if you turn me your Bible, so it's 2 Kings 13. I want to turn to 2 Kings 13. This is a very fascinating story, but it's um, with bows and arrows, which I love. And it says this. This, this, was, um, uh, El this was Elisha. This was uh, Elisha at the end of his life. He, he comes to a king called Jehoash. Now, Jehoash... Um, wasn't a very uh, righteous king. He was an evil king. And he was fighting the Arameans at the time. And I'm going to read you. I'm just going to read you what happened. So, uh, 
Now it says, now Elisha, it's his verse 14 of 2 Kings 13. Now Elisha was suffering from the illness from which he died. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows. And he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Open the east window, he said. And he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said. And he shot. The, this is what the prophet said. The Lord's arrow of victory. The arrow of victory over Aram. Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. Then he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you were defeated only three times. Uh, you see, what happens was this. He, he, he took the bow and arrow. He put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, shoot, fire the bow and arrow. And he shot it. And he said, that is victory. That is victory for you. So, and then he said, strike the arrows. Take the word of God that God has given you. And strike it on the ground. And he struck it three times. And he stopped. And he stopped. And he only defeated the Arameans three times. And the prophet said, why didn't you keep striking it? For you would have destroyed them. And I, I'm saying this. If, if God has given you ground to take, if he has told you to expand his kingdom, and he has given you his word, that's what you fight on. That's what you fight on. His word to you. And you don't give up. You're not half-hearted. Don't ever give up. I know Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel, if you remember, um, from up north preached here. Um, that's been about a few years ago. And he told this story, and I know I've said it before, but I'm going to repeat it again. He was... Um, he was in his, I, I can't remember what country Ezekiel's from. Can you remember, Simon? What? Zambia. He was, he was back in Zambia. He went back there. And uh, they, uh, they were out, and they found, they were out in the, in the outbush, and they found a lion trapped in, in, a, in a snare. It had caught the lion in a snare. And... Uh, and it had given up. It was, it was, it, it had given up. But it, when they got to it, the the lion had kicked and kicked and kicked to get free, and it hadn't got free. And when they saw the trap and the lion, they concluded this: one more kick and he'd have been free. One more kick and he'd been free, <laughs> and he'd given up. Given up. And I'll tell you this: there are some of you that are praying, have been praying for years and years, or for a long time, and you haven't seen the answer to prayer coming. And you said, and, and you said, ah, oh, I've done it enough. I'm going to give up now. I'm saying to you, don't give up. Don't give up. For if you don't give up, God will give you the land. I tell you this, I don't know if you've identified land. I've identified land in my life. I've identified land I'm going to take. I'm going to extend my borders. I'm going to. And God, and I've sought God, and he's given me words. Seek God to get words, and then fight on those words. I'm telling you publicly now, I am not going to let go. I am not going to stop hitting those arrows until God fulfills his word. Some of you are calling for a move of God. We sung about it today. 
You're looking for a move of God, aren't you, Gareth? Don't give up. God's going to move. Are you up for this, folks? Take your battle bow. It's the work of Christ. Fill it with his word. Keep going until God fulfills what he says. There's a, there's a word I put up. Uh, um, there's a word that I want to um, speak about, and it's, it's, it's the word confess. I, I love Greek. Um, that's it. Um, the, the word confess. I love Greek. I am not an expert on Greek. But some of these words I love. And confess is, is homologio. The Greek for confess is homologio. Homo is same. Logio is uh, the speak. So we speak the same words as God spoke. That's all he had to do. That's all the, uh, the king had to do. He had to speak what the prophetic word had been said to him. In other words, I'm, I'm claiming God's victory over the Arameans. Keep speaking it. When God gives you a word, speak the same words as God. When Satan comes and accuses you, you repeat what God says about you, not what Satan says. Do you understand? Speak the same things as God says. Homologio. Don't forget that. The second thing is this. I, I want to just speak. It's gain arrows as well. I love this. It's, it's in Zechariah again. And it's Zechariah 9 verse 13. It says this. Listen to this. It says, I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. When I looked at that, I thought, what on earth is that about? The, the simple truth is this. When Zechariah was speaking this, Israel was a divided nation. It was totally divided. In fact, the southern kingdoms were Judah and Benjamin. The northern kingdoms were the, the other ten tribes. They were Ephraim. Now, what the prophet was saying here is when the bow is bent by Judah, there will be unity. God will fill it with Ephraim. In other words, there will be unity amongst the people of God. That never happened. It never happened. That prophecy from Zechariah never happened. There was not unity amongst the people of God until Christ came. Until Christ came. When Christ came, he came to bring unity. I'm telling you this. When the church is in unity, Satan will be defeated. I, years and years ago, years and years ago, um, I, I, God doesn't give me many visions. But I had a vision, and um, it, it was a very clear vision. It was a picture of two armies um, on either side of a valley. Um, it was in medieval times. They're all. And uh, one was the army of Satan, one was the army of God. And the army of Satan, they were, they were all dressed in black, and they were all drilled, all in order, ready for war. All totally ready, armed and everything. And then I saw the army of God. And it was, it was horrifying at the time because they were still getting dressed. Some of them, some of them were still getting dressed. <laughs> they weren't ready. They weren't armed. Um, some of them were eating and drinking. Some of them were sort of lying back, enjoying the sun. <laughs> they were... That, but worst of all, worst of all, some were killing each other. Some were killing each other. How tragic. We are not against other Christians or other churches. We are not competing against other brothers and sisters. Their success will always be your success. No Christian will succeed at the expense of another Christian. Never. It will only be 
when we support one another and we love one another. Listen, no prayer victory will be achieved just on our own. God wants to unite his people. When we're together and united, damage will be done. That's what Jesus prayed for. That's what he came here for. That's what the cross was meant to achieve, that we might be one. In fact, it says in Matthew, um, I, again, I've got another Greek word here. If you, if, um, I, I, don't normally, I don't normally use a lot of Greek words, but um, it, uh, the word agree in the Greek is symphonio. It's, can you find Greek interesting? Isn't it fantastic? Some is, uh, phonio is sound. Phonio is sound. You know, you, your telephone and things like that. Um, some is together. To agree is to sound together. Where, what English word do you get from that? Symphony. Do you understand? Symphony is when, when people play together musically and beautifully in harmony. Let me say, some people quote the scripture, if two or three agree, then, then God will do it, and he will. But agree isn't, oh, let's just agree on this one thing. That's, that's not what the Bible means when it says two or three agree. It means if we are living in harmony with each other, if the church is sounding together, I love our Bible weekend, one voice. That's what that is. One voice is speaking the same thing together, sounding together. Listen, folks, I, I just want to throw this out as a challenge. It's time we as a church pray together. Not six or seven people. Not even, and I, I'm, I'm not against praying individually on our prayer um, network or whatever it is. But when the church comes together and sounds together, Satan, wo Satan will fear. And when the churches in a city get together and pray together, Satan will tremble. I hope I've, I've communicated some of this to you because um, I do believe this, that it's time we took up our armor. It's time we did. The, the, I, I think I was with um, a group of uh, students and the, um, they were talking about the, the particular time that is happening now. And um, uh, they were saying, well, is it, is it? Are we nearing the end time? Well, I don't know. Um, but I do know this. Things are hotting up, aren't they? Things are coming to a head. And even this morning, I got a prophecy um, that uh, came on my phone uh, saying that we're to be ready. We're to be ready at this time. And folks... Um, we're to be an army. We are to be an army. And, and an army is, 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 is not um, concerned totally with civilian things. <laughs> do, do you understand? We're called to fight. And, and either when, the, when that day of evil comes, if we're prepared and equipped... And strong, we can fight. So my, my, my call to you, this is the word to us as a church. That we're to center our lives and everything on Christ and the cross. That we're to take new ground for him. It might be personally new areas in our lives. Maybe people we're praying for to get saved. Maybe influence in a city or in our street. We're to take new ground for God. But we will do it through warfare. In Matthew 18, it says, it says, Since the day of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God is advancing by force. And men of violence take it. Now, my call is this. Uh, I love God's people. I, I love you people. I've got to say it. 
But um, sometimes Christians are too nice. <laughs> Do you understand? We are to be nice. We're to be nice to each other. But we're not to be nice with Satan and demons. We're to hate wickedness. Christians need to learn to hate. Hate. Jesus loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God anointed him with the oil of joy. If you want to be joyful, truly joyful, love righteousness and hate wickedness. And I, my call to us now, as a people of God, it's time to go to war. It's time to go to war. Satan is fearing when the church of God takes up the battle bell. That's what Christ came. He came to, for us to take the battle bell and to defeat Satan and to defeat demons and to take this land for Jesus. Amen. Amen.